Thank you very much for inviting me to come and present to you today. I've been given quite a wide brief um, in terms of the diabetic foot pathway, and that starts at one end at screening right the way through treatment of foot ulceration and rehabilitation. So to cover that in what was 40 minutes and it is now 25 is going to be quite tight. Um, so I'll do my best to get through most slides and we'll try and do a little sort of um, little bits of each bit so you, you get the understanding of the diabetic foot pathway but hopefully at some point in the future we'll be able to do each bit bigger and we can talk about wound management, we can talk about screening in more detail, and we can talk about preventing foot problems as well. So I'm just going to ask one question because you've been sat there now for half an hour and you've not moved and you've listened to Earl Howe and he's got a very um, eloquent voice and now you've got some Mancunian coming to talk to you and you're not sure if you'll be able to understand him so I'll, I'll get one conversation from you. If you thought about diabetic foot disease uh, diabetic foot ulceration, what would you think would be the worst thing for a patient? Amputation. Amputation. And that's common view within uh, diabetic foot world, within nursing world, within, within this arena. Um, there's a big elephant in the room. It's, I think it was like the dance floor last night when I got up there, but this is what the, we're talking about in terms of there's an elephant in the room. In reality, people with diabetic foot disease, their worst outcome is death, and people don't realise this. When people get a diabetic foot ulcer, there's a 50% chance of them being, of being dead within a five-year period, and that's higher than a lot of cancers. We should start thinking of diabetic foot disease as a cancer. If we look at the mortality rates, I'm sorry to bring you back down here, aren't we? we're talking about death first thing in the morning, but it's worse than breast cancer. Uh, prostate cancer, colon cancer, the mortality rates at five years are worse. So if you walk into clinic tomorrow and there's a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer or there's two patients with diabetic foot ulcers, the chance, that one, the chance of one of them being dead within five years are very high. There's a lot of work being done um, across, across the UK and this is work done by Matthew Young up in Edinburgh which suggests that 47% of people are dead within five years at presentation of their first diabetic foot ulcer and at 10 years it's around 80%. So we talk about amputation, and uh, that's important, and prevention of amputation, and that's what the rest of the slide and the presentations are going to be around, is the prevention of amputation, the prevention of ulceration. But in reality, what we should be thinking about is the prevention of mortality. And that's a different message that we're not really getting across to nurses, to podiatrists, to the patients, more importantly. We're not giving them that opportunity to understand that we can do something about that when they present with that first ulcer. So when the Diabetes UK person came in, yesterday and did the presentation last night, uh, Richard Lane, and said, I got my first diabetic foot ulcer and was saying how good the treatment was. I bet nobody spoke to him about his risks of death within five years. Although they treated the ulcer and got it better, I bet nobody actually discussed that with him. And he's the, the, the president of Diabetes UK. So we need to think about these types of messages. Sorry to bring it right down to us to start off with, so I'll make it a little bit more light-hearted as we go through. For people who don't know, and I'm sure you do know, I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour of what diabetes actually does to you. Uh, we talk about neuropathy, and that's loss of nerve sensation. And neuropathy is often described as God's greatest gift to mankind. If, you've got, if you can feel things, you know when something's going wrong. If you lose that ability to feel things, you don't detect pain, you don't detect trauma, you don't detect uh, un, uh, inflammation. So you get somatic neuropathy, where you get decreased pain and proprioception. So you lose the ability to know where your foot is in space. So you walk in an abnormal way, and I often do the ministry of funny walks, but instead of walking normally, like this, you often end up walking, not putting your foot down in the right place, putting abnormal pressures, abnormal stresses on the foot. It also creates this muscle imbalance, and that increases the abnormal stresses on the foot. You have autonomic dysfunction, and most people, particularly nurses, understand about postural hypotension. Within, within a diabetic foot, the reflex that goes first is the sweat reflex. So you get fissuring, a dryness of the foot, and that causes a portal of entry for bacteria. So when you see your patients in your leg clubs or in your district nursing services or in your podiatry services and they've got anhydrotic skin or dry skin, we need to think about moisturising these feet and, and getting them moisturised because as soon as they get cracks in them, they get a portal of entry for bacteria, they get infection, then they get a foot ulcer. You also get abnormalities in blood flow where you get altered flow regulation as a result of abnormalities of vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Macrovascular disease, so diabetics get uh, atherosclerosis, well they get it at a younger age, it's more aggressive and it affects distal vessels rather than the proximal vessels. So in this room, most of you, unfortunately there's another bad sign, most of you will have some atherosclerotic changes, you'll have narrowing of your arteries, it starts about nine years old now, uh, so some of the children are starting to get fatty streaks being demonstrated. So us that are moving on in age will have more fatty streaks, but our fatty streaks will probably be higher up in the aorta, 
in the, in the femoral vessels. But diabetes patients tend to get it below the knee, so they get it between the knee and the ankle. And if you think about that, that's further away from the main blood flow, so it's, easy, it's harder to bypass, it's harder to angioplasty, so it's harder to treat. So ultimately, what you get is a diabetic foot ulcer, an ischemic foot wound, or a neuropathic foot wound. And in reality, most have a combination of both. So you get a, a neuropathic at one end, an ischemic at another, and somewhere in the middle you get neuroischemic, and there, that's what we see most of. Is that making sense so far? Whizzing through at 25 miles an hour? I'm going to talk about risk now, and people may recognise me on my holiday last year. <laughs> Within the diabetic foot world, what we try and do is stratify the patients so that we tr put our resource in at the patients who need it most, so the people who've got increased risk of developing a foot ulcer. So we don't treat all people with diabetes the same. We will try and stratify that and work out who's, gonna, who's more likely to develop a foot ulcer and try and prevent them happening. And this is me on my domiciliary visits in Salford. <laughs> so what increases the people's risk of developing a foot ulcer, and this is a, a big study done actually up in the northwest of England, and it was done over um, uh, 16,000 patients, uh, Caroline Abbott, looked at if you had a foot ulcer, you're going to get another one ultimately. It's around 60 to 70% chance of developing a new foot ulcer once you've had one foot ulcer. The presence of neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, and foot deformity. So the change in foot shape as a result of um, diabetes and neuropathy. And age. But there are other few other things that you should consider. So social isolation, which is where the leg clubs will come in. That social isolation where patients don't talk to each other, have got nobody to communicate that problem with, don't interact with healthcare services. So isolation, particularly male, middle-aged, go to the pub, and that's all that's their social activity. Uh, loss of vision, they get retinopathy, and renal disease, nephropathy. Patients with renal disease do really badly. So if patients have got renal disease and diabetes, they often get ischemia, they often get gangrene, and often have problems. So what can we do in assessment? What can you do? How can you assess that patient? In reality, you, what, we, what we can attempt to do is do um, neuropathy assessment, vascular assessment, and try and educate the patient within a, a short period of time. We're not going to be able to do a foot examination. We're not going to be able to do a medical review, but ho hopefully these are the three main things that we can attempt to do in a short assessment. There was a paper, a, a document that was produced two years ago, and it does say podiatry competency framework, but in fact it's a diabet diabetic foot competency framework. And this takes you through the whole range of competencies that you might need from actually doing undertakes foot screening to debriding a wound to doing uh, infection management. So this is a good document if you want to look at uh, a way of trying to develop your skills within, uh, and competencies within the diabetic foot management. So how do we assess risk? How do we assess for neuropathy? Well NICE tells us that we should assess foot sensation and palpate foot pulses. So how do we assess sensation? Have you all come across monofilaments? I'm talking to the converted here. So a small fibre that bends under 10 grams of pressure. Uh, it was developed in the leprosy colonies originally, because they're the other people who tend to get uh, neuropathy. Um, so it, if, if, you got, if you can't feel it before it bends, then you've got loss of sensation. And vibration perception, usually using a, a 128 megahertz tuning fork. When you go through different trusts and different organisations and different obsessions, people talk about, oh, you need to do 15 monofilament tests, you need to do 25 monofilament tests, 10 on each foot. In reality, three is enough. If you do three tests, big toe, underneath the first met head, which is the ball of the foot on the, on the medial side, and on the, under the fifth met head, they're the three sites you need to test. That's what the international consensus tells us. If you do these three sites, you'll pick up, and one of them is negative, in other words, they can't feel at that site, you'll pick up 97% of people who have neuropathy. You don't need to do 10 sites. In fact, in reality, you could only get away with doing one site if you really well, only had time to do one site, and that's just behind the proximal nail fold on the big toe. But to be, to be evidence-based, 97% of people you will pick up just doing them simple tests. But just to prove that there is 3% of people out there, I'll just take you through a quick case study just to wake, wake you up a bit and show you some gammy feet, as we like to do. So this patient, type 2 diabetes, reasonably well controlled. He could feel the monofilament. He could feel me touching it. He had palpable foot pulses, so he had normal feet. He lived alone and no other comorbidities. He came to one of the community clinics, had a red bunion for about a week. The skin came off and it bled. And he was referred urgently up to the hospital team because he was having rigors in the waiting room. He was shaking, shivering. I was actually on the golf course. I remember getting the phone call saying, I thought, oh, I'm doing a proper consultant here today. I'm on the golf course playing golf and get this urgent call. So I didn't come off the golf course. I sent somebody else, as, as you do. But he had osteomyelitis, an elevated CRP, which is a measure of inflammatory, and an elevated glucose. And this was his foot when he presented. We haven't got a um, point, have we? But if you look at the 
X-ray there. He's got destruction of the bone in that area, so he's got osteomyelitis, he's got spreading cellulitis, he's got infective gangrene. He's not got gangrene as a result of poor circulation. That second toe is gangrenous because of infection. So I didn't believe the test that they'd done because he couldn't feel that. He had that amount of infection, that amount of ulceration, and he couldn't feel it. But I did t retest the monofilament, and, and he, he could feel the monofilament. But then we have a special machine which fires volts at people, so it, you can rev it up. And if you, if you, you should be able to feel it before it gets to 25 volts. So I tried it on my two-year-old at the time, just to see how I took it up to... <laughs> and, and he didn't jump when I got it up to 50, so we were fine. <coughs> so it, but I got this guy up to 50, and he couldn't feel the, um, the, 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 the vibration perception. So he'd lost vibration perception, but not pain protection. So this was his foot. Um, and this, we, we took him down to theatre about two days later, and, and this was unfortunately done by some 12-year-old with a toolkit, I think, because he left us with an extremely difficult uh, wound to try and get better. It's like a, a, sh a, sh a shark's mouth, so it was really difficult to try and treat this. But over uh, an 18-month period, using total contact casting, infection management, inpatient care, outpatient care, topical negative pressure, we eventually got the wound healed, and um, he went on to... Uh, to hopefully live a normal life because I've not seen him back th since but he's, he's actually done okay and he's under the care of the preventative foot care program. That's a joke, in case you feel sick of my jokes, put one up there. <laughs> so how do we assess for in, uh, circulation? We talked about neuropathy, we use the monofilament, it'll pick up most of them, it'll pick up 97% but you will miss a few. Um, and there's only two reliable indicators clinically, which are symptoms, that's claudication, or symptoms of rest pain, or symptoms of ischemia, and pulses. They're the two things that are really reliable in terms of the evidence. So the DP pulse, the postibial tibial pulse, and sensation. So we use a validated questionnaire called the Edinburgh Claudication Questionnaire, which is really a good way of measuring whether somebody's actually got claudication or not. You can use temperature, and all the other tests like temperatures, lack of hair, slightly off-coloured skin, atrophy of the skin, all sort of fill in the background, but the two that give you the best evidence are symptoms and pulses. So the others help. I, had a, I do a vascular triage clinic as well one day a week, and I had a, a, he was young, I say he's young, because he was only older than, one year older than me, so he must have been quite young. But he, was an ex, he came in, he walked in, and it was query vascular disease. So he was uh, mid-40s, hairiest legs you've ever seen, massive muscles, walked in, I thought, this guy's not going to have circulation problems. His um, feet wouldn't look normal, couldn't palpate pulses, ankle brachial pressure, ankle, systolic ankle pressure of less than 50, classic cr critical limb ischemia symptoms, yet looked normal in terms of his hairs, his skin condition, etc., etc. So I packed him off to the um, vascular surgeon straight away. So we talked about Doppler yesterday. I saw there was a Doppler workshop, and I'm sure you're all spot on with Dopplers, but... In terms of diabetes and vascular disease, and there is a risk with the ABPI in terms of the calcification of the arteries. So we often go on waveforms rather than pure ABPIs. They help add to the picture again. So we talk about triphasic waveforms, just to wake you up. So you've got a nice triphasic waveform. I'll find that one. Biphasic with two sounds, loss of the second um, forward flow. So that usually happens as you get older. Past 70, you start to get biphasic waveforms naturally. <laughs> Down to a monophasic waveform. That means that there's a stenosis or an occlusion somewhere higher up. Ah, I'm going to talk about death again now. So, if you've got peripheral arterial disease, I'm not talking about diabetes now, these patients without diabetes. Again, what do people most worry about when they say, I've got peripheral arterial disease, I've got calcification, I've got uh, hardening of the arteries, I've got this problem. What do people think about, think about amputation? Well, if you take 100 patients who've been diagnosed with intermittent claudication, there is probably another 100 patients who've got intermittent claudication who don't go and see anybody about it. So they'll, they'll say, they'll, oh, I've got a bit of aching of the legs and, you know, a bit of Les Dawson hanging over the... Uh, fence talking to his neighbour, you know, I've got a bit of achy legs and this, and they've probably got intermittent claudication. And then there's another 100 patients who've got peripheral arterial disease but no symptoms. So for every 100 you've got diagnosed claudicants, you've got another 200 out there. If you look at the five-year outcomes of these patients, local events, so what people like me are usually concerned with, which is, are they going to lose the leg? 
They'll get 25 patients who of that will have in worsening cordication, 10 will have revascularization, and two will have an amputation over five years. So out of that 100, only two will have an amputation. If you go on the other side, in five years' time, there'll be 30 deaths and another 10 to 20 non-fatal MIs or strokes. So 50 of that 100 will have a major cardiac or, or mortality event. So again, it's not the circulation we're worried about, it's not the amputation, it's the patient's going to die. So when you've picked somebody up who's got poor circulation, don't just think, I need to get them to the vascular surgeon. Think, I need to get them on a statin, I need to get them walking, I need to get them to stop smoking, I need to get all these other things done to try and help that person uh, keep their leg and keep their life. I thought you were telling me off then, I'm only halfway through. I'm I'll, I'll whiz, I'll whiz. Okay, so we're still on risk. So other considerations, renal disease, which we talked about before, deformity in conjunction with diabetes-related foot disease, and diabetes-related eye disease. And I've put this picture in because this is what I mean by diabetes-related foot deformity. When you get neuropathy, the muscles in the foot stop working because they've got no nerve supply. But the muscles in the leg continue to work normally, and often they insert into the foot. If you remember back to your anatomy when you did your anatomy. So you get an alteration in the foot function because the muscles in the leg continue to pull, and the muscles in the foot stop pulling. So you get this muscle imbalance. So you get this change in foot shape. So the foot gets this rigid, high-arched foot. And if you think about that, you've got areas of pressure so here, here, and on the toes. And they've got neuropathy, so they can't feel it, so they're in a shoe that rubs, so they get foot ulceration. So the change in foot shape is really important in terms of creating that risk for foot ulceration. So if we look, if we've done our risk stratification correctly, what we'll find is that around 60% of people with diabetes just need annual foot screening. So they'll have no evidence of neuropathy, no evidence of peripheral vascular disease, and they'll just need checking annually. And then there's around 35% who've got either vascular disease or neuropathy or foot deformity or a combination of the three and they need regular podiatry in a foot protection program and then you have around five percent who have active foot ulceration or infection or risk of amputation and that really should be managed by an MDT. If you think about Salford because that's where I work we get we've got about 11,000 people with diabetes so around six and a half thousand of them just need screening every year and around three and a half thousand need annual foot check, uh, regular podiatry review and five percent will have problems. So this is the this pyramid in another way. Low risk treatment and assessment can be done by any suitably trained staff. Increase in high risk should be done under the foot protection team, which is community-based. A multidisciplinary foot care team, which I feel shouldn't just be sat in a hospital waiting for the emergency to happen, which should be an integrated approach across primary and secondary care. So when you've got low risk patients, now we're going through the pathway now, we've assessed them, we've risk stratified them, what happens to them? So a low risk patient should have an agreed management plan for education tailored to that person and how to access the service if they drop a brick on the foot or if they stub the toe or whatever, if they cause some damage to the foot, they should be able to get into the service and have some treatment. NICE have said that we should have quality standards and we should be able to recognise that risk foot, which we just talked about, and they should have regular review by a foot protection team. So the foot protection team, and I've spent probably the, too long over the past 12 months trying to write a definition of what a foot protection team is so that commissioners can commission a foot protection team. And people keep sending it back and trying to change one word here and half a word there and put an and in and a but in and a what in and a can in and a can in and it's doing my head in, shall we say. But a foot protection team is basically there to try and protect the foot from going on to foot ulceration. It inspects the feet, vascular assessment of the feet, evaluate the footwear, enhance foot edu education and routine podiatric care. We know that podiatric care makes a difference. If you reduce callus, it reduces pressures by around 60, uh, 30%. If you put them in appropriate footwear with that deformed foot, you reduce the risk of ulceration. So that all works and helps prevent foot ulceration. And this is the definition we're working towards, but I'll whiz through that. So, red flags. We've talked about low risk. We talked should what happened to the people who've got increased risk, who've got neuropathy, who've got vascular disease. What happens then is red flags. And NICE talks about any new ulceration, discoloration, swelling, or pain. If any of these things, these are red flags. These are things that should be referred to your foot protection program or your multidisciplinary team urgently. So there's a simple ulceration. And we've got this callus here, which looks normal. It looks like it's just a, a bit of hard skin between the toes. But when you take the callus off, you can see an exposed ulceration. So evident 
things like that that should be referred urgently to the multidisciplinary foot care team. It should be that they're moved on uh, for ongoing management. So callus often hides ulcerations. And as podiatrists, I would, I would ask, as, as a podiatrist, I was asking nurses, so when the patient comes in and said it was all right until I saw the podiatrist, I didn't have an ulcer. It's often because it's we find them and they were there already. Or it was, he made it a lot bigger, that bloke with that scalpel. Um, so just, just defend us a little bit and say, yes, they've actually found it. It was already there. They need to debride it properly to make the full extent exposed and all these types of things. And you also need to remember that high-risk feet can deteriorate rapidly. This is an old slide, but this patient was admitted, uh, treated with um, hydrogels on this ischemic-looking wound on the heel. No re ongoing referral. Three weeks later, this foot's gone wrong. They've got spreading infection, spreading cellulitis. Uh, the moist wound healing has created this over-wet area, maceration, spreading cellulitis. The patient goes for in, been admitted into hospital for intravenous antibiotics and ultimately a baloney amputation. And the other thing, what well, they've always got two feet, people, until they've had one amputated. You need to look at the other foot. So this person went into hospital to have that baloney amputation on that side. They've developed another heel ulcer on the other side while they were in hospital. Went into motion, ended up with a baloney amputation on that side. So from that simple wound, they've ended up with bilateral BKA within three months purely by poor management, lack of recognition, lack of referral, and, and lack of looking at the other foot. We do a quiz, in, well not a quiz, when the junior doctors come down um, for their medical exam, we always send the patients up, and we always tell the patient for the medical exam, don't take your shoes and socks off, just take one off. And if they don't take the other shoe and sock off, we fail them. So we, have to, we say to them, make sure you take the other shoe and sock off, because that's where the problem's likely to be. Everyone concentrates on the little ones on the other foot, and there's probably a bigger one on the other one, because they've got neuropathy and can't feel it. So we talked about them red flags, ulceration, swelling, heat, pain, redness, any new discoloration should be referred to an MDT. And this is the scary bit, this came out in 2011, that all those requiring urgent medical foot problems should be routine by an MDT within 24 hours. That's difficult, especially when you look at, and we were talking to uh, Jackie Sturt last night, and we were discussing MDTs. And this data suggests that in 2011, there was only 40% of people had an MDT in their area. So if you've got to go, you've got to refer them direct within 24 hours and you haven't got one, I don't know what you do. That's since gone up to around 70%, but there's still 30% of the population don't have an access to an MDT. So you've got to work out locally what you're going to do with these new ulcerations and new problems. So this is how we felt when we were told to give the MDT in 24 hours. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to consider. You've got your patient there and the MDT comes running along. This happens every time you get a new ulcer in Salford. 16 people rush to save people the leg. And we have a surgeon, we have a podiatrist, a radiologist who are really good. We like a, an ambulance meant to bring the patients in and out of hospital, get them there urgently. And I couldn't find a picture of a microbiologist, so I just put a bug on there. <laughs> but in reality, we don't sit there at the hospital waiting for these patients to come in. An MDT starts really at your advanced podiatry team, at that role. Through A&E, you need, you need that, that build up that relationship with a, an A&E a, 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 an &E service and a podiatry service that runs regularly so I can take these patients in within a day. And this is our integrated team. Um, we've got nursing staff on there. This man at the front, scarily, is also called Dr. Paul Chadwick. So there's two of us in the same team called Paul Chadwick, which is a bit worrying. He's a microbiologist, so I put him at the front because infection's the destroyer of the diabetic front, and he's the one that actually helps us stop infections. So um, we've got intravenous nurses who give out uh, home IV therapy. For, uh, we've got podiatrists, we've got technicians, we've got an orthotist, we've got uh, diabetes consultants, uh, uh, foot care assistants, etc. And they all make these nice casts and things, but that's our team. But we don't sit there all day waiting for the next patient to come in. We, just, we, we see them once a week in that team. Started off with death. Um, we need to think about changing the mindset. And I hope, if you don't remember anything else I said in this presentation, that first discussion about death, about the fact that people who have diabetic foot ulcers are at risk of dying within five years. It's a high risk of death. If you get a diagnosis of cancer, everyone goes, oh, really sorry, Bob. You get a, a foot ulcer, everyone goes, oh, you've got a foot ulcer, oh, they'll just put a bit of dressing on it, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. They don't really talk about that process that's going to occur. So if diabetic foot disease is cancer, we should be talking about putting people in remission. We should be talking about getting them healed, and we should be talking about preventing their mortality. Because 
We're trying to prevent death and we're trying to prevent amputation. So to summarise, and I think I've tried to keep it in time. Yeah. See? Not bad, eh? <laughs> Simple screening involves assessment of the nerve circulation structure of the foot and circulation. All patients with increased risk should be, should be referred to a foot protection program. Foot ulceration, infection are medical urgencies and we should be referred to an MDT. Let's see if you can get this one. <laughs> if you've never stood on a Lego, you'd know about that one. So I'm about to disappear, but if we've got a fantastic, I'm just, this is my plug, I do it at every conference I can get to speak at, but we've, if anybody's interested in joining FD UK, it's open to any healthcare professional in the country. It's an organisation, it's got its own website, it, it provides support, there's a web-based forum, there's a, a free journal that comes with it, and it's, it's, um, it provides information for people involved in diabetic foot care. So you can ask them questions, you can put links on, and, the, and, and people will help you with any queries you've got. That's my email address, can you see that? Yeah, it's on there. And we've got our big conference in Harrogate this year, which is the Wound UK conference, but we have one day uh, seminar all the way through. We've got, it's our 10 year anniversary, so if you can get along to that, we've got uh, world experts coming in. We've got Ben Lipsky, who, who wrote the international guidance. We've got David Armstrong, who's well recognised as well. So it's going to be a fantastic conference. So if you can get there, that'd be great. And I'll try and answer any questions. Thank you very much.